Welcome in everyone as everyone's gathering in uh, as we take the time to let everybody get prepared for the class if you'd like to we'd always like to see where everybody's coming from so drop us a uh, on the chat there where you're, where you're in at right now. We got a couple more people just waiting to get in California Atlanta real close to you Mandy. Yeah, not far. Florida. I saw Holland, Michigan. I was in Michigan last week. <laughs> Ohio. A couple of New Jersey's in there. My home state, right where I'm at. Yeah. All right. So I think we got everybody in. Let's let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class, the Windsor Newton Watercolors Farmers Market Market class. My name is Tim DePack, and I'll be your host, and I'm from Windsor and Newton. And I'll be joined by Mandy Peltier, who'll be your artist instructor for this class. And Mandy will be taking you through today's class, providing some information about the products being used in the class, showing you how to perform some watercolor painting techniques and creating these freshly picked vegetables straight from the farmer's market with our Windsor Newton Cotman watercolor paints from the Sketcher box set. Before we begin, let's just let you know that there was a sketch provided for you prior to the class. If you haven't done so, we can provide the link for you in the chat for you to download so you can work along with uh, Mandy. And also that the class is being recorded. So within 24 to 48 hours, you'll be able to go online to the Michaels YouTube channel or michaels.com and rewatch this video afterwards. So if you wanna choose to paint along with Mandy or if you wanted to sit back, relax and, and take everything in and come back at a later date and do the project, you're more than welcome to do so. And with that being said, I'm gonna pass you over to Mandy Peltier. All right, thanks, Tim. Hey, everyone. I am Mandy Peltier, and I'm excited to be back with another class. Today, we're going to be doing another subject matter that's right up my alley. We're going to be learning how to paint vegetables, but today's class is more of a loose watercolor style. So I think it's pretty beginner friendly because you don't have to get it perfect and it's still going to look really good because it's meant to be loose and imperfect looking. So we only have an hour and I have a lot to share with you guys today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my other camera so we can get started. All right, so uh, here's the freshly picked vegetables, as Tim said. I always love the little <laughs> the little expressions he uses for the classes. So um, it says, meet me at the farmer's market. So this is going to have just a little, little bit of lettering on it, and then we'll spend the rest of the time painting the vegetables. So I'm going to quickly go over the supplies so you can just make sure you have everything that you need. We are going to be mixing a lot of colors today, but eight of them are... Uh, yeah, I believe eight of them are going to be straight from the Skechers pocket box set. So there's going to be less color mixing than normal. And so I do have my 10 well artist palette because I'm going to use all 10 wells and one of my two center wells to mix my colors today. I have two glasses of water today. You don't need to have two glasses. I'm just going to use one of them to mix my colors and then I'll use the other one for when we actually start painting the vegetables because we are going to do some slight washes today. Um, but you don't have to go grab a second glass if you don't have one. And paper towels, a graphite pencil, and eraser if you haven't already transferred the outline. I always do recommend you transfer the outline before class because I think it just makes these one hour fire hose classes a little bit less stressful. And then I'm just using one brush today, a Cotman round number six. And there's a new supply that I'll talk more about in a little bit. I'm using a Windsor Newton Pro Marker, and this is just a permanent black marker. So if you don't have the Windsor Newton Pro Marker, you can use another marker that you may already have. You can also paint on the lettering because that's what this will be for, um, but I'm going to use this one today. And then I just want to quickly talk about the paper today because this is a new paper from what I've normally used in my classes. I'm still using Windsor and Newton cold pressed 140 pound watercolor paper and I've cut it to be eight by 10 in size. But what's different about the paper today is that I'm not using the professional paper. I am using the student grade watercolor paper that looks like this. It comes in a sheet of 12. It's the same weight as the professional paper. It's also acid free like the professional paper. So it's not gonna yellow over time. But the difference is the professional paper is 100% cotton and the student grade paper is 25% cotton, 75% cellulose fibers, which is just plant material. So while I normally use professional paper, cause I just like how the paint settles into the paper 
better and I have a little more flexibility. When I'm doing loose paintings, I will oftentimes reach for the student grade paper intentionally because I think it the, the properties of it lend itself to a loose look. So that's why I'm using the student grade paper today. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and put some things aside so we can sketch the outline. That's going to take us a minute here. And then we can get started on the actual project. So I'm going to keep my 8 by 10 sheet of paper, my graphite pencil eraser, and I'm going to pull over a print off of the actual outline. I like to work side by side because it's a little bit easier for me to gauge the size of what I need to draw. So I'm going to start with the lettering. The farmers is what's right in the middle. So this is actually what we're going to start with first because it's going to be easier to draw what's right in the middle and then draw what's above it or below it. So I'm going to start. This is just how I do it. You can just eyeball it if you want. I'm going to start by just placing a small dot right in the middle approximately of my eight by 10 sheet of paper. This is just to set my eyes to where the middle is, okay? And then farmers is a really good word to start with because it has an odd number of letters. So we can start with the M, which is the center letter. So I'm going to draw the M right in the middle of the paper, sort of a little bit above and a little bit below that center dot I drew. And I'm just gonna use my outline as a guide for uh, how it should look. And I actually got mine a little bit too big there. So I'm just gonna make some corrections here. All right, so I have my M, I'll just hold it up so you can see, I just put an M right in the middle of my paper. And if you look really carefully at the outline, you'll notice that the bottom of farmers is a very, very slight arch. The bottom of the letters is a very slight arch where the top of the letters is just a straight line across. So I am going to draw a very, very slight arch under the M so I can use that as a guide for the bottom of each letter for farmers. So just a really slight arch. It's not dramatic at all. It's just super slight. And then I'll go ahead and draw a straight line right above the M. So the straight line is going to go right above the two points of the M. So I can also use that as a guide for farmers. You don't have to do this. You can eyeball it. This just helps me. This is sort of my method. Uh, how I sort of work it out on the paper. And so now I can just go through and write each letter. I like to work right to left initially, and then I'll work backwards. So I'm going to start with the E. So I'm going to put the top of the line of the E at the very top and then go all the way down to the arch. And then I'm going to follow that arch for the bottom of the E. And I'm just going to work my way and I'm going to draw each letter. You can use your own font. You don't have to copy the font that I'm using today. You can do your own thing. But by drawing the very slight arch at the bottom and the straight line at the top, you can see how it sort of creates the bottom of these letters to have a slight arch to them. And I'm not going to erase my sort of guidelines until the very end when I have already placed the pro marker down and that has thoroughly dried along with the watercolor paint. And I'm going to work backwards and do the R on the other side of the M and then I'll do the A and then I'll do the F and then we'll move on to the next letter. All right. And you uh, can do this a little bit faster, a little bit slower than me. Do it at your own pace. The good news about these classes is even if you think I'm moving a bit fast, these classes are recorded. They'll be uploaded to the Michael Sturb YouTube channel within the next 24 to 48 hours. And you can always rewatch and hit the pause button to keep up. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the market below. Um, just take note, the very left side of market lines up perfectly with the A. And so that's where I'm gonna start to sort of line up my lettering. I'm gonna start with this little frill on the left of the M and make sure that is lined up with the A. And then I'll go ahead and do the rest of the M, just sort of following my outline as a guide for style and placement. And then I'll move on to my A and my R. And the Mandy, as, as you're making this, I'm just gonna do a call out. Uh, someone said that they were gonna change theirs up a little bit and put farm fresh instead of farmer's market. And anybody can do anything they want inside. That's the nice thing about this. Go back and watch the replay and you can catch up to where Mandy's actually working on all of the uh, the actual vegetables on it, but you can change any of that text that you want in the middle of there to say what you want. 
Absolutely. These classes are inspiration. Uh, you can copy it verbatim or you can do your own twist on it. I love it when students do their own twist on it, especially when they send me their work and show me the twist that they did. I applaud it. You, you make it your own for sure. All right. So I went ahead and wrote out market and I'm going to go above farmers now and do the, the, <laughs> the, the, and the word the is centered just above the letter M of farmers. So I'm going to use that sort of as my guide here. And the is pretty small. It's the smallest lettering of everything in this lettering. So I'm once again, just kind of following, um, my outline here as a guide for placement. And I'm going to put those two little lines on each side of the, those little stylistic lines. And then above the is meet me at, and that has a more severe arch. So I'm going to draw a more severe arch above the, the, <laughs> you know, I lived in a country where articles were not part of the language. The was not part of the language. And as an American, I don't know how like you can speak without using the, I don't know, but um, other languages are able to do it. Okay, so the M is sort of above the H of the, so I'm gonna place my M there and I'm just gonna write it real small using my arch as the guide. And I'm just- Andy, gonna... someone's asking which, which country was that that it was wasn't using the- Poland. Mówisz po polsku? All right, that was, do you speak Polish? I do not. Not very good anyways. I can say emergency Polish and I can go shopping, but that's about it. <laughs> and I can say, I do not speak Polish or I speak very bad Polish, but I am learning. I can say that too. <laughs> All right. And just let everybody know, once Mandy's done with this, she'll hold this up to the camera so everybody can see this a little bit closer on there. There we go. Yep. All right, so I have my lettering down. And now we can draw the vegetables. So um, I'm gonna start with the carrot. I'm right-handed, so I'm sorry for those of you who are left-handed. I always apologize for that because I'm sensitive to it. My dad is left-handed. Um, so, but I'm right-handed. So I'm gonna start by working from left to right. And I'm gonna kind of go from the carrot all the way down to these sugar snap peas. And then I'll start at the eggplant and, and work left to right from there. So I'm gonna start with the carrot. And so I need to leave room for the stems and the leaves, but I'm just kind of gonna draw a bit of a wavy oval that kind of meets at a point to draw my carrot. Just once again, kind of using my outline just as a guide for style and size and all of that. And then I'll just put in a couple little lines just to reserve that space for the stems and leaves. And then we have a cayenne pepper that's pretty much the same shape as the carrot. It just has a slight bend to it and is a little bit skinnier. So I'm just going to follow along with my little outline here to draw my cayenne pepper. My husband loves spicy foods. And after 14 years of marriage, it's growing on me a little, <laughs> a little. I'm just, I can't handle as much spice as he can. All right, so now we're gonna do the cucumber. The cucumber is a little bit thicker than the carrot and the cayenne pepper, but it doesn't come to a point on either end. So you're basically just making a really rough looking oval. So I'm gonna draw the cucumber now. And I'm gonna do some demoing today because all of these vegetables are meant to be drawn pretty quickly or painted on pretty quickly. Um, so I'm gonna demo to kind of give you an idea of what you need to do to hopefully make it a little bit easier when we do it together. If you can watch me do it one time. I'm not gonna do it to all of them because some of them use the same technique, um, but I will do it for some. And it will also maximize the hour. It may cause us to go over a couple minutes, but I think it will really help with comprehension and helping you understand what needs to be done. All right, and now I'm going to draw the bell pepper. The bell pepper is basically, I'm gonna start by drawing a rounded square. So just a rounded square, and I probably should have spaced my cucumber a little bit differently, but that's okay. So I'm gonna start with a rounded square. So you see how I didn't do any uh, right angles on any of the corners. I just did a rounded square. And now I can sort of do the indentation. So I'm gonna start here where we have that really small indentation and then I can sort of shape it and form it and bring it down and then back up. And then I can do this other side here. So I started with the basic shape and then I'm kind of forming and shaping it from there. That is sort of um, a beginner principle to drawing. If you don't know where to start, start by drawing the basic shapes that you see 
and that will get you off on the right footing. And I do that with everything, whether I'm painting, whether I'm drawing, it doesn't matter. All right, and then I'll give him a little stem. All right, so I have a bit of a skinnier bell pepper today just to kind of smack. Okay, and now our two sugar snap peas kind of look like big smiley faces, don't they? Look like big smiley faces without the teeth. So we're going to uh, draw them so that they sort of, uh, one goes this way and the other goes the other way. So I'm gonna start by drawing the first one here. I'm gonna draw the bottom part of the smile. And I'm gonna bring it back up and give it a little stem at the top. And then I'm gonna draw another one kind of going the other direction. So just think of it as two smiles, two big toothy smiles without the teeth. Right. So there's Andy, can you hold that up a sec so people can you hold that up a sec so people can see it how you're doing that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just let everybody know she's doing that a little bit darker on that so everyone can see that on the screen. So if you're at home, you might be doing that a little bit lighter and as you're you're drawing out the shapes. Yes, good point. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to the eggplant here, and I'm going to start with the calyx. That's the part that's at the top of the eggplant that looks like leaves. Um, so it kind of looks like a fairy skirt, I think, <laughs> with the stem on top. So I'm going to start with the stem here, and then I'm basically going to be drawing kind of three petals. So I'm going to do that here. Actually, I'm going to move mine up just a little bit so I have more room for my actual uh, eggplant. So I think eggplants are such pretty plants, but I am not a big fan of eggplant. I'm no offense to those of you who are, um, but it's so pretty. I wanted a lot of color in this piece. So of course I put it in, but that's one vegetable I don't grow in our garden. All right. And then I'm going to then draw the body of the eggplant. The eggplant is basically like an oval with just a little bit of movement to it. And there we go. All right, and now for the mushroom, I'm gonna start with the mushroom cap, which almost has a heart-shaped curve along the bottom and then sort of a dome shape up top, almost like a kidney bean, like a really fat kidney bean. And I'm gonna draw its stem. And the way we're gonna paint the mushroom is a new technique. And it's also gonna be the same technique for my class next week, which I'll show you in just a little bit. And I'm going to do the radish. The radish sort of has a subtle heart shape to it. So I'm going to start at the point and bring it up and give it like a subtle heart shaped curve and then pull it back down to the point and then give it a little root here. And then you can always make some adjustments and I'll put in some of the greenery there. So I kind of preserve that space for when we're ready for it. You can always make adjustments. I wanted to make mine a little bit wider. It was a little too skinny for a radish. Okay. And then I'm going to save the peas because the peas are easy to squeeze in. I'm going to draw the tomato now. So I'm going to start by drawing just a circle for the flesh of the tomato. I do love tomatoes. Oh my word. I love tomatoes. I could eat my body weight in them every day, I think. All right. And then I'm going to draw the stem. And I'm going to draw four leaves, uh, two on each side of the stem, just using my outline as a guide. All right. And now I can kind of squeeze in those three peas in between the mushroom and the tomato. So I could probably shift over my radish a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about that for today. I think this is good enough for today to learn how to um, paint all of these vegetables. But before we get to painting the vegetables, I want to mix all of our colors first. In some of my classes, we mix them as we go. But in this class, we're going to mix them all at once. And that's because it really doesn't take much time to paint each of these vegetables. So in, instead of painting the carrot and then mixing a, a color and then a minute later painting the cayenne and then being ready to mix a new color, it's just going to make sense to mix them all at once today. All right. So I am now going to pull down my palette glass of water, my trusty Skechers pocket box set, and my number six brush. And this is going to be a review for those of you who have taken one of my classes before. But for those of you who haven't, I'm going to start by putting my number six brush 
in my water glass and just giving it a stir to help those bristles absorb the water. And then I'm going to use my brush as if it were a spoon. And I'm going to place two scoops of water into every single well on my palette, including one of my center wells. So I'm going to literally use it like a spoon and go one, two. And I'm gonna do this to every single well on my palette, including the center well. If you get a little bit more water in there than two scoops, that's okay. Our goal is to just give us clean water to work into our half pans to create the watercolor paint mixture. And our goal is also just to have an equal paint to water ratio, or even maybe slightly more paint than water. And uh, because I'm going to be doing a little bit of demoing for you today, I will probably need to remix some of my colors, but doing it this way for you all at home should be the perfect amount. So I have placed two scoops of water into every well in my palette, including my center well. And we're going to start by mixing the colors that are just one color from the set, where we're not going to be mixing two colors to create a new color. We'll save those three for after we mix all of the single color paints. So into one well in your palette, it doesn't matter which one, I'm going to uh, mix into that the cadmium yellow, which is the darker of your two yellows on the top row. And I'm going to do three passes. And what I mean by a pass, one pass is me taking my wet brush and without using dainty pressure, I'm going to run it into that half pan a handful of times and I'm gonna stir it into the well on my palette and then I'm going to just quickly wipe it a couple times on the edge of the palette just to release excess paint. And that's one pass. And I'm gonna repeat it, actually I'm gonna repeat it three or four times because I really want uh, at least equal paint to water ratio or even slightly more paint than water. So that was my second pass and I'm gonna do it a third time. And I think I will do it four times today, four passes of each color, because it will just help get that um, nice, uh, consistency of paint. I have a little swatch here. So you can see how these uh, swatches are not washes. They're very vivid. Um, they're, they're very uh, at least equal paint to water ratio, slightly more paint than water even. All right, so that's our yellow. And then our next well is going to be our cadmium red pale hue. It's the one that looks like orange. So I'll just quickly swish my brush in the water, blot it on a paper towel, and then I'll repeat that process of four passes, but this time I'm gonna go into the cadmium red pale hue and I'll stir it into the next well on my palette. So do you see the process here? We're just doing four passes of each color, stirring it into those two drops of water. And this way each color has clean water to mix into. So there's our orange. And I might be moving a little fast, it's okay. You'll have some time to catch up, I promise. Into the third well, we're going to do alizarin crimson, which is the red. So I'm going to switch my brush, blot it, and then repeat my process. If this doesn't have to be a slow process. I'm pretty quick about it. I just quickly stir it into the half pan a handful of times, deposit it into the well, wipe, and repeat. So it doesn't have to be a slow process. All right. And there's my red. And now we're going to do sap green. So we're going to move to the bottom row now, the second one in the bottom row, it's the lighter of your two greens. I'm gonna make sure my brush is nice and clean because red and green are opposites on the color wheel. And so that means they de-intensify each other when added in part to one another. So I don't want my sap green to be darker than it should be. So I'm gonna do four passes now of the sap green. I'm kind of doing four and a half passes here today, actually. It always depends just on the day. Sometimes three passes is enough. Sometimes four is. Just kind of depends. All right. So after the sap green, we're now going to do yellow ochre, which is right next to sap green. It's the only yellow that's on the bottom row of the Skechers Pocket Box set. And that will be on the next well of our palette. I know it takes a second to uh, mix these colors, but I, I assure you it's worth it. And it's what makes this piece so colorful and so fun and vibrant. I just love it. I think this would make such a cute uh, wall hanging in your kitchen or dining room or something like that. It would just be really sweet. And after sap green, we are going to mix burnt sienna, which is right next to yellow ochre. I said sap green, so sap green and then yellow ochre, and now we're gonna do burnt sienna. So it's the more orangey brown or reddish brown in your set. 
and that will get its own well of color. So I'm going to mix the burnt sienna. Burnt sienna, I find that the pigment doesn't release as readily from the half pan as some of the other colors in the set. And you're going to learn there's one color in this set that releases super readily. And so you have to be very dainty with it. Um, but with the burnt sienna, I find I usually have to do a few more passes to really get that pigment into the, uh, the well or half pan. All right, so there's my burnt sienna. And we're going to also do burnt umber, which is the dark brown in your set. So burnt umber is going to get its own well also. Do the same number of passes, just try to get equal, if not a little more equal paint than water ratio. This is a pretty palette, I think, but I think all the palettes are pretty. I just like color. All right. Now, after the burnt umber, rinse your brush really good because we're going to do white next. And uh, if there's some brown left on your brush, you could get more of a tan, which is truly not a big deal. If it happens, it's truly not a big deal. Every time I practice this, my white ends up being slightly tan and that's okay. The white we're gonna use on the mushroom. So it's okay if it's slightly tan because white is not gonna be the predominant color or the only color used on the mushroom. It'll just be the initial color used on the mushroom. So into the next well on your palette, the eighth well, mix Chinese white. You can tell it's a color I use a lot of. It's the one that gets changed the most often in my set, I think. Okay, so we have cadmium yellow, uh, cadmium red pale hue, alizarin crimson, sap green, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, burnt umber, Chinese white, and we have three left. These are the three that we're going to mix together to make a new color. So two colors to make a new color. And the first color we'll mix is a red violet shade. And we're going to mix red violet using alizarin crimson and intense blue. I don't normally use intense blue in my classes. I mean, I have before, but I usually tend to be an ultramarine girl. So we're going to use the intense blue, but don't touch the intense blue yet. This is the one that really easily lifts off of the half pan. So we're going to start by doing um, three to four passes of alizarin crimson into the ninth well on your palette, just like we did when we mixed the red over here. Okay, so three to four passes of alizarin crimson. All right, and then after you have your alizarin crimson, I'm not even gonna clean or blot my brush. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going too daintily this time. I've said before, don't be dainty, but this time we're gonna be dainty. And I'm gonna take the tip of my brush and I'm just gonna run it maybe four times, just gently on top of the intense blue palette. And I'm going to stir that into my red. And you'll see how just that little bit of paint on your brush will turn your paint that red violet color. Now, if you use too heavy pressure on the intense blue and you've turned this color purple or you've turned it um, even a, a blue, uh, you know, a, just a, even darker than purple, like a, a, a blue violet or something, um, then you can add more red to tone it down. Um, but so I just use a lizard crimson and then just a very small amount of the intense blue to get a red violet here. And now I can rinse my brush. And now we'll mix a purple, but instead of mixing purple with the intense blue, I really like how the purple looks when it's done with the ultramarine blue. So we're now going to mix the alizarin crimson and the ultramarine blue in equal parts. So I'm going to do two passes of alizarin crimson and two passes of the ultramarine blue into the 10th well on our palette here. So I'm gonna do a couple passes of the ultramarine blue. And I'm not even gonna clean my brush when I go into the uh, ultramarine blue here. And I'm gonna do a couple of passes of that. After the first pass, it'll look pretty similar to the red violet, but after the second pass, it should look purple. And if it doesn't, you can always add a little bit more ultramarine blue. On this one, you should uh, have equal parts or even slightly more blue than red in order to get it to look purple. All right. One more color and then we'll be ready to paint. All right, so the last color we're going to mix is a dark green. So I'm going to do that with the Viridian hue on the bottom left row and the Burnt Umber, which is the darker brown in the set. So I'm going to do three passes of Viridian hue and one pass of Burnt Umber in order to get a dark green. So three passes of the Viridian hue. I have to use one of my center wells for this one since I just have a 10 well palette. You may only have one center well, so that's okay. Just use the Viridian 
hue and the burnt ember on your one center well. I've seen some palettes that just have like 30 wells on it. Uh, I actually have one of them and I don't use it very often because it's so big. Um, so this should give you like a good army green or like a hunter green uh, mixing these two colors together. A really pretty nice dark green. And there's our palette. So I know that took a minute and I am sorry, but um, we are ready to get going now. Uh, actually, what we need to get started with first is drawing the lettering. So I am going to pull out my pro marker. I can tell you about this now. It is just a permanent black marker. It has two tips. It has a regular marker tip where it just creates strokes that are the same width. And it also has a chisel tip, which is a typical marker tip. So you can get really thick strokes or like what I do is I can use just a tip of the chisel to get uh, skinny lines. Do you see those skinny lines I can get with just the tip of the chisel? So I'm going to use the tip of my chisel tip to draw on the meet me at the part of the lettering. And then I'm going to use the traditional marker tip to draw on the farmer's market so that it's a little bit thicker than the meet me at the part of the lettering. So I'm going to start with meet me at the, and I'm just going to use a tip of the chisel. You can use the marker tip for all of it if you want. And so I'm just going to carefully use the tip of my chisel and I'm just going to go over the lettering meet me at and then the and you can paint this on if you wanted. Um, I think learning how to paint words and letters with brushes is its own learning curve, which is why we're using a marker. Plus just drawing it on is a little bit faster, but you can use a paintbrush after this class is over if you want and just paint it on as well. And I'm going to use the regular marker tip for the farmer's market lettering. And I'm going to go somewhat slow as I draw on the farmer's market lettering just to help that um, the marker to sort of bleed into the paper and create a slightly thicker line than what I was able to get with meet me at the lettering. All right, and you could also, I introduced in my class last month, I did a Just Peachy class and we used a ProMarker watercolor brush. Uh, or marker. So it is watercolor, but it's also a marker. It's both. And we used that. You can also use a watercolor marker for this. That would also be really pretty. And the watercolor markers, they have the this tip, the same tip right that I'm using here, but it also has a brush lettering tip. Whereas the pro marker uses a chisel tip in addition to just the traditional marker tip. All right, so there's my lettering. Put my caps back on. All right, and if you weren't able to do this with me, you can totally do this after the class. There's nothing fancy about the lettering. It's just going over the letters one time with the marker. Okay, so I have actually, before this class, as I was practicing this class, because these vegetables move fast, because it's all pretty much wet into wet, um, and this paper does absorb the paint pretty quick. So you don't have a ton of flexibility to just make adjustments and, and make corrections. I actually took the time to trace another one of these and I'm going to demo the ones that are starred. I'm going to demo for you first and then we'll do them together. So that way you can sort of see how I do it and I'll walk you through as I demo and then we'll do it together. And that should hopefully make it a little easier to comprehend the process and make it a little less uh, intimidating. So I, this is my demo one. Maybe I'll write demo so you can know. So you don't try to do it along with me. So if I have my demo one out, just watch and learn. And then we can do the actual one together, okay? So I'm going to start with the carrot. And I'm going to switch my water glass to my clean one here. Mandy, can you put the finished piece on the on the screen too for people oh, to kind of see yes. so they can go along with it? Just absolutely. yeah, so they have an idea. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. This when I work on bigger pieces like this, it's hard to get everything in camera, but I think we're good. I think we got everything we need. So whoops, and I somehow got red. Oh, it's just my demo piece, so it's okay. All right. 
So I'm going to start with the carrot and what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to take the, um, the orange, the cadmium red pale hue, and I am going to add this color to the entire left side of the carrot. And again, I'm just demoing. You don't need to do this along with me here. And then I'm going to quickly swoosh dab and I'm going to take the burnt sienna and I'm going to paint that along the upper curve of the carrot. It just adds a little touch of brown. And then I swished and dabbed. I'm gonna take the alizarin crimson and I just like to put a pop of red sort of on this upper left curve here. And I like to put a pop of red sort of at the bottom tip of the carrot. Kind of makes it look a little bit like an heirloom carrot, if you will. And then now what we're gonna do, or what I'm gonna show you is a wash. So I'm going to take my brush, I'm gonna swish it in the water. I'm going to wipe it several times on the edge of my glass and I'm going to add clean water to the rest of the carrot, I'm going to start applying it right next to where I drew that painted on that line. And you'll see how it kind of creates a wash. It sort of pulls that paint where I'm adding the clean water, almost like a gradient, if you will. So it just adds a subtle value of color to the rest of the carrot. And then once I have that down, I'm gonna take a little bit of cadmium yellow. I'm gonna sort of pop that in through the middle I'm going to take just a little bit more red. I might pop that in along the left edge. You can even put a little bit more red down on the tip if you want, and you're done. Like, that's it. That's the carrot. Okay? So it went really fast, right? But hopefully me demoing it for you first will make it a little bit easier to follow along when we do the actual thing. Just remember, these are meant to be loose. doesn't have to be perfect. I have a little bit of negative space right there, uh, which is good. It adds a little bit of interest. So I'm going to pull over my for real one now, the one that we drew together. I'm gonna to start with the clean brush here. And if you remember how I started is I take the cadmium and pale hue, I put that on my brush, and I'm going to apply that along the entire left side of my carrot all the way down to the tip. And you can just apply the stroke, just whatever is the natural thickness that goes down with the number six brush, that's fine. And then clean your brush. Blot it, take that burnt sienna color, apply it to that upper curve just to add a touch of slight brown. Swish, blot. And now this is where I take my alizarin crimson or my red, and I like to apply it sort of along the upper left curve and along the bottom tip of the carrot. Okay, and then this is where I'm going to add that wash. So I'm going to swish my brush, clean it, wipe it a few times. I'm going to run it right up along the edge of that line that I painted on and I'm going to apply that to the rest of the carrot. To create a little bit of a wash a little bit of color on that carrot, but the color is going to stay concentrated where I painted that line. And now I can put some yellow just right through the entire middle of the carrot if I want. I'm just dotting it on. I might dot on a little bit more of the orange along the left side little bit over the yellow if you want and it will create a yellow orange and then I might take a little bit more red and apply it along the tip and that's the carrot okay and we're going to save the greenery and the leaves for the end we'll do the flesh of every single vegetable and then do the stems and leaves uh, when we're done painting on the initial initial thing so the cayenne pepper has essentially the same technique as the carrot. So I'm not going to demo the cayenne pepper just to save time because we're already 20 minutes out. These classes go so fast. All right, so I'm gonna start by using the red and I'm gonna apply it along the entire bottom edge of the cayenne pepper. Okay. And then I'm not going to clean my brush this time. So don't clean your brush. So I applied red to the entire bottom edge. I'm going to place just the very tip of my brush into this dark green. Remember how I said green and red are opposites on the color wheel and they de-intensify each other. So the green I just put the very tip of my brush into and the red that's still on my brush are going to mix within my brush to create a new color. And this is an important technique because we are going to rely on this technique for a class that I'm teaching in September that I'll show you in just a little bit. So I'm going to apply this color to the upper curve of the cayenne pepper and maybe along the middle of that line I drew and maybe along the very tip. So just three places, the upper curve, the middle and the bottom tip. 
And now I can swish my brush, clean it, wipe it, wipe it more times than you did with the carrot because we have less to add water to, and then apply water to the rest of the cayenne pepper that doesn't yet have water. And it'll create that little wash, okay? And then you can drop on more red to the bottom half of the cayenne pepper and you're done, okay? I know it moves fast. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to demo the cucumber for you because the cucumber uses uh, a couple special techniques. So I'm gonna set this one aside. I'm gonna pull my demo one back out. And we'll demo this really fast here. So for the cucumber, I'm gonna start by taking the dark green and I'm gonna basically make three stripes down the cucumber. I'm gonna place one on the left edge and I'm gonna go about three quarters of the way down the left side of the cucumber. And I'm going to place another line on the right side, also going about three quarters of the way down. And then I'm going to place one right down through the middle. And they're kind of wavy. You see how they're kind of wavy? And I'm going to extend this one a little bit further. Kind of looks like monster claws, I think, when I look at this. So, uh, and then without cleaning my brush, I'm going to place the tip of my brush into the yellow. And I'm going to paint on that bottom curve of the cucumber. And you can see that creates like a cucumbery color. All right. And then swish my brush, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it. I'm going to apply that water to what's left of the cucumber. And it will pull from some of the wet sections to create um, a green, a slight green color. All right. And now what I can do is I can take my dark green again, and I'm going to place lots of small dots, just holding the tip of my brush down those dark green stripes that I painted on initially, and this will just kind of give it that cucumber texture. So that's the cucumber, okay? I think we can do that together. All right, so I'll pull back over my original one. I still have dark green on my brush, so I'm not gonna clean it this time. And let's paint on a line along the left edge of the cucumber, go about three quarters of the way down. Paint on another one along the right side of the cucumber going down about the same length. And then paint one on through the middle that extends a little bit past the sides. All right, and then this is where you're not going to want to clean your brush. You'll wanna place just the tip of it into your cadmium yellow and paint that on along the bottom curve. You can work in between those lines kind of creates a little bit of a yellow green, but kind of a cucumber green. And now I can swish my brush, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it, so we don't have too much water on our brush. And I'm gonna apply the water to the remaining sections of the cucumber that don't yet have any paint on them. Okay, and it already looks like a cucumber, it's just lacking some texture. So this is when I'm now going to put a little bit more of that dark green on my brush. I'm gonna hold my brush pretty much straight up and down. And where I painted on those three green stripes, I'm just gonna place dots of green randomly down those stripes so that it kind of serves as texture for the cucumber, those little spots you see on cucumbers. And uh, since this is still partially wet, you can even go over it again with more of these dots when it's dry or even um, partially dry. All right, so, um, but for now, that's the cucumber. Uh, I love how the cucumber looks. I think it has a really sweet kind of loose look to it. I might even do a couple dots down here. All right, the bell pepper is another one that I need to demo for you because it has its own little thing going on with it, but then uh, I won't have too many more to demo after that. I think just the mushroom. All right, so for the bell pepper, it starts off easy. It starts off just applying the cadmium yellow to the entire bell pepper, literally all but the, uh, the stem. So I'm applying yellow to the entire bell pepper. And I'm not going to clean my brush after the yellow. I'm going to dip just the tip of it into the sap green this time. So the sap green's over here. So just the tip into the sap green. And I'm going to apply it bottom left of the indentation, bottom right of the indentation, and top right of the indentation. So I'm just going to sort of drop it in. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point. That is not perfect, all right? And I will clean my brush, a lot it. I'm going to put a little bit of orange on my brush. And I'm going to run that up along the indentation. Also, this little indentation here along the right side edge. 
along the entire left side edge. Okay, and then blot, clean and blot. And now I'm going to add a little bit more yellow to it. So I'm going to go over the green and just sort of lift it up. And this adds a little bit of texture. It kind of smooths out the orange that was applied. And then what I'm going to do is the wipe and lift technique. So I, I showed this, I demoed this on my red, white, and blue popsicle class in, I think it was June. So how you do the wipe and lift technique is I'm going to take my brush that currently has paint on it. I'm going to clean it, blot it, blot it, blot it. I'm going to run it once up the side of the cucumber that's to the left of the indentation. I'm going to run it once up the middle indentation and once up the right indentation. And do you see how that creates form and it creates segments for the bell pepper and it makes it look uh, more 3D than just flat. So even though this is loose and it's quick and it's easy, we still want the form. We still want there to be some representation there. So that's the bell pepper. All right, so ready to do it with me? <laughs> I know we're moving fast here, but I did warn we might go a couple of minutes over today, but I do think this demoing is really important today since these are really fast. All right, so we're gonna start by applying the uh, canary yellow to the entire bell pepper. So let's take the canary yellow and apply it to everything. And remember, don't rinse your brush after you apply the canary yellow to the entire bell pepper, because we're gonna use that technique of allowing a new color to mix with the paint that's already on the brush to create a new color. So we're mixing on our brush versus on a palette. And that's really important. Like I said, I'm going to be teaching the class in uh, September where we rely on that for the most part. All right. And then I'm going to put just the tip of my brush into the sap green. And I'm going to dot that in to the left of the main indentation, to the right of the main indentation, and up at the top right to the right of that other indentation. Clean my brush, blot it. I'm going to put a little bit of the cadmium red pale hue or orange on my brush. I'm going to run that up along the entire main indentation using just the tip of my brush, that little right side indentation, the right side of the bell pepper, and the entire left side of the bell pepper. Then I can clean my brush, blot it, and this is now where I'm going to add more yellow for texture and to sort of smooth out the green and the orange. The green's still going to stay there and it's still going to add a little bit of color to your bell pepper. Um, but even this yellow, I see I'm just kind of using like hatching strokes. It just adds some nice texture. I'll hold that up so you can see. That alone adds some nice texture and I haven't even done the wipe and lift yet. But I'm going to do that now. <laughs> so I'm going to clean my brush, blot it, and I'm just going to run my brush up through the middle to the left of the indentation, up through the middle of the middle segment, and up on the right to the right of this little indentation here. And you'll see how that just creates some nice form. Okay. Now, I think we can do the sugar snap peas together. They're quick and they're easy. So the sugar snap peas begin by getting um, an application of the sap green to the entire bell pepper. And I actually wanna mix a little more, I told you I might have to mix a little more color today that you guys won't have to. All right, so a little more cadmium yellow there because we're going to need that for this. All right, so we're going to work one sugar snap pea at a time. So we're going to start by applying sap green to the entire sugar snap pea, but try not to have too much brush or paint on your brush because this is not very big. We don't want any puddles of paint on our sugar snap pea. So try to just uh, have just enough to cover the sugar snap pea. And if you find that you have too much paint on your brush, you can always blot it on your paper towel to remove excess. All right. And then while it's all still wet, I'm going to put a little bit of the dark green on my brush. And I'm going to drop it in at the stem, at the bottom tip, and maybe along um, the more arched, arched side of the smile. Okay. And then I wanna drop in just a little bit of cadmium yellow, maybe down towards the tip, just drop it in. It will create like a bit of a yellow green shade. And then now what I wanna do is that wipe and lift. So I wanna clean my brush, blot it, and I'm just gonna go right through the middle and just lift right through the middle. And then as all this dries and settles, it'll take on more of this look. My uh, dark green might be a little dark, so you can always kinda 
finagle it around, but that's the sugar snap pea. So we get to do it again in case you didn't quite follow along the first time. So I'm going to start with some sap green. I'm going to cover the entire sugar snap pea with it. All right. And then I'm going to put some of that dark green on my brush, apply it to the stem, the tip, the more arched side of the sugar snap pea. And then I like to just drop in a little bit of yellow in there just to create a little bit of a yellow green shade. And now I'll do the uh, wipe and lift right through the middle, just like that. And I'm just gonna interrupt you for a minute. We're about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. I just wanna let everybody know that if they have to run when it gets to the, the top of the hour, that the class is being recorded and available for review in 24 to 48 hours on Michael's YouTube channel or the Michael's website. So it will be here for everyone to watch afterwards if they have to leave. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Tim. And these, these last ones go really fast. So we're gonna do the eggplant. I don't need to demo the eggplant because it's very similar to the other ones that we have done. So we're going to start with the purple, your purple color. You might need to give it a stir to kind of remix those pigments. And I'm going to outline the entire flesh of the eggplant, including in between the calyx. So I'm going to go around the entire edge of the eggplant here with the purple. And like I said, I'm going to go in between the calyx too. Okay, so I just outlined the whole thing with purple and I'm not going to clean my brush. I'm going to dip just the very tip into the yellow ochre. Purple and yellow are opposites on the color wheel. And I want to apply the yellow ochre uh, where the calyx is. So along the upper left and in between the calyx. And I'm also going to apply it down here to the lower part. And you'll see how it kind of creates a purplish yellow color. And now we can swish our brush, wipe it and add water to the rest of the uh, eggplant flesh that doesn't yet have paint. And then you can see how this already started to dry. It dries so fast. So that's why we have to work so quickly here. And now we can drop some more purple in, maybe along the left edge where I kind of want it to be a little bit darker, maybe a little bit along here where it's sort of dried with a harsh look. And then if you want, you can always clean your brush, blot it, and then do even another wash in the middle to kind of pull that color in. But it's just those two colors, the eggplant, it's just the purple and the yellow ochre. And you're still doing that wash technique where you're pulling water into the middle part that doesn't yet have any pigment. And we'll save the calyx, that will be really fast. Now the mushroom, I do want to demo because I'll show you really quick. In one week, one, one week from today, same time, August 10th, I'll be showing you how to paint these blueberries. I'm on a food kick right now with these classes, and it will even be true for my class in September. And these blueberries use the same technique we're about to use for this um, mushroom. So I'm going to start by actually applying clean water to the mushroom cap. So just clean water to the mushroom cap. And then this is what I'm using the white for. I'm going to apply the white just with dots to about 75% of the entire mushroom cap. So I'm just randomly going all over it with the white and I can just blot it. And then I'm going to pick up a little bit of the yellow ochre and to the left side of the mushroom, I'm going to apply it to maybe 50% or so. Okay. And now I am going to pick up a little bit of burnt sienna and I'm going to apply that to about 50% of the right side. You can go over a little bit, the yellow ochre. And all these colors are going to bleed into each other as they dry because I started with water and then I started with dots of paint all over it. And uh, now I'm going to put a little bit of the burnt umber on my brush. I'm going to apply that along the right side and along the bottom edge. So there's some distinction between the mushroom and the stem. And then what I'm going to do is I have some burnt umber on my brush, right? And some of my previous classes, you've learned that the burnt umber and the ultramarine blue make a black. So I'm going to take my brush with the burnt umber on it and I'm just wiping it a few times on my ultramarine blue. And now I'm going to have a black that I can kind of add along the very bottom edge to create some separation there. All right. And then um, I can tell I didn't add enough color to the entire thing. So I might just add a little bit more yellow ochre 
maybe a little bit more burnt sienna. So it's just dots, 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 and they'll all kind of bleed together and look like a mushroom by the time they're done. And the stem is done no differently. All right, so I think that's a good enough introduction um, so that we can do it together now. So very first thing, make sure you have a clean brush and we're going to apply water to the entire mushroom cap. Just uh, clean water, at least as clean as your glass of water is. Just apply that to your entire mushroom cap. And then we'll put some white on our brush and we're going to dot this to about 75% of the total mushroom cap. We're just gonna get some white paint on there for the other colors to sort of soften into. And adding water first also allows us to not dry as fast. It kind of slows down the drying time just a little bit. And then I'm gonna put some yellow ochre on my brush I'm going to apply that to about 50%, maybe it's even 75% of the left side. And then I'm going to put some burnt sienna, maybe the other half, 50% or so of the other half. I might go over a little bit into the yellow ochre, just lots of dots. And then the other brown, the burnt umber, we're gonna apply it to the right side along the very bottom. And if you want, um, I can still see mine needs a little bit more color. You can add more white if you want. It'll create like a tan. You can create, you can add more yellow ochre. Oh, but with the, the burnt umber, once you have some burnt umber on your brush, run it into the ultramarine blue to create a black. And you can apply that along the bottom edge just to create a bit of a distinction between the mushroom cap and the mushroom stem, okay? And then you can even take it and add a couple of dark dots along the top as well. And then for the mushroom stem, it's the same process. I'm just not gonna use the yellow ochre. I'll just use the white and the browns. I'm just going to add white to the mushroom stem, but I'm gonna try not and go all the way up to the top of the mushroom cap because it's still wet and it would just bleed right down into the stem. So I'm kind of stopping my water just before the top of the mushroom cap. And then I can take just a little bit of white because the mushroom stem is not very big so you could very easily add too much paint and then maybe a drop or two of the yellow ochre maybe a drop or two of the burnt sienna and then maybe a drop or two of the burnt umber and the nice thing about the mushroom cap is um while everything is still wet, you can always make adjustments and add more drops of color. Um, you don't necessarily have to stop after each color. You can just keep on making adjustments, adding a little bit here, a little bit there until you like how it looks. Um, but literally that is the technique. We'll just maybe do it a bit more precisely with the uh, blueberries that I'll be teaching next week. All right, so radish. All right, so the radish. We are going to basically do the same technique with the radish as we did with the eggplant, just with different colors. So I'm going to start with my red violet and I'm going to outline the entire radish with the red violet, including the little root that makes it look like a radish. So just outlining the entire thing. And then I'm gonna put the tip of my brush into the purple and I'm going to apply that to the upper left, the upper right, and right where the tip of the radish meets the root. Then I'm gonna swish my brush, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it, wipe it, water to the rest. And the radish is so small that I oftentimes don't even feel like I need to drop in more color. Once I add the water, it looks good to me, it looks done. You could do a wipe and lift if you wanted right through the middle, but that's just a stylistic choice or option if you wanted to. But that's the radish. It's just the red, violet, and the purple using the same strategy as we did with the eggplant. And the peas, super fast, <laughs> super, super fast. So we're going to apply a little bit of the sap green on our brush and apply that to each pea. You could kind of just stop there, right? Doesn't that just sort of look like a pea as is? <laughs> but what we're going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of the dark green on my brush and I'm going to apply just a drop or two of it. And it can be to the very top, the very bottom, the very left, the very right, it doesn't matter. But just a drop of it on uh, one side of each pea. Let it bleed in organically into the sap green. And then clean your brush, blot it, blot it, blot it, blot it. And I just do a, a slight wipe right through the middle of each pea, okay? 
and then one to go and then i'll quickly show you how to do all the greenery and then we'll be done so for the tomato we're just going to take our red we're going to outline the entire tomato in red same technique as the other ones we're going to use the opposite of red which is green so put the tip of your brush into the dark green and we're going to apply that along the entire left side I think I'm going to have to mix some more dark green real quick. So the entire left side of the uh, tomato. And now we can clean, clean, clean water to the rest. Now the tomato is big enough. I do like to drop in a little bit more red because that looks too pale for a strawberry, right? So I'll drop in more red along the left side and that will continue to blend in with that dark green and create more of a burgundy shade. And I'll probably drop in more along the right side, but you're just dropping it in, letting the paint bleed into um, the wet part. And if you need to finagle it a little bit, you can kind of take a clean brush and just sort of swoop it in. But that is the tomato. You could just keep fussing with this, adding more red as you wish and uh, darkening up the sides if you want. But that is the tomato. All right, so now all we have left is the greenery. The greenery is fun, it's simple. Um, let me just quickly mix up a little bit more dark green. I think I'm good on the other colors here. Um, so for the carrot, I'll show you really quick how to do the carrot on my little demo piece. So I'm going to use the sap green, the dark green, and the burnt sienna. So I'm going to start with the sap green, and I'm just going to use my brush, and I'm just going to apply a few strokes in different lengths and widths. And maybe on top of one of them, I'll kind of hold my brush to the side and just dab it twice to kind of look like leaves. And then I'll put some dark green on my brush and maybe add a couple more and also add a couple little <clears throat> leaf looking sections by just dabbing my brush on the side like this. You're just dabbing it. And then I like on the carrot to just add one or two using the burnt sienna as well. But that's all you're doing for the greenery for the carrot. So let's do that together. I'll walk us through it. And it's the same for the radish. I just try to make the strokes in the leaves a little bit thicker for the radish. So I'm going to start with the sap green. I'm going to add maybe three stems of various lengths and thicknesses. And maybe just to one of them, dab my brush twice toward the top to create a look for the stem. And then dark green, I'm going to repeat, add a couple using the dark green and a couple blots for leaves. And then I'm gonna add just one or two with the burnt sienna as well. Cause I just think it adds a nice pop of color for the carrot. So that's the greenery for the carrot. And we'll repeat that for the radish when we get down there. For the cayenne pepper, it's just painting on the sap green to the entire stem. And then you're just going to drop the dark green along the upper curve. So just along the upper curve, just to create a little bit of color. So it's sap green to everything and then the dark green just to the upper curve. That's it. All right. And then for the bell pepper stem, I'm going to start by once again applying sap green to the entire stem. Sap green to the entire stem. Then I'm gonna take the dark green, I'm gonna drop it in along the base of the stem where it meets the bell pepper and along that, along the right side. I'm just gonna go up the right side with the dark green, just like that. And then I like to also put some dark umber in there. So I'll do the same thing, dark umber along the base of the stem and along the very right side edge. Allow it all to bleed into each other. And then I also like to do one lift. So I'm cleaning my brush, blotting it, and I'm just gonna wipe my brush up the left side where it was just the sap green. So that's it for the uh, bell pepper stem. So it was sap green and then the dark green along the right side edge and the base of the stem, burnt umber to the same spots. And then I just did a wipe on the left side of the stem. All right, I know I'm moving fast and I apologize, but we're just a little bit over today. So I'm trying to hurry this along here. All right, so the eggplant, we're going to cover the entire calyx with the sap green. And then we're just going to drop in the dark green at the, the on the stem and the tips of the calyx. So I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna rotate my work. So, oh, I messed up rotating my work. So it didn't really work in my favor. All right, so I'm applying the sap green to the entire calyx. And I'm going to put some of that dark green on my brush and I'm going to drop it in to the stem 
And then at the very tips of the calyx, the ones that look like kind of triangles, I'm just going to drop it into the bottom tips of the calyx. And then we're going to allow that to just bleed into the sap green organically. And then for the radish, the radish is the same as the carrot, only I don't use the um, burnt sienna. I just use the dark green and the sap green. So let me just, I ran, I did run out of dark green. So I need to mix it for a third time really quick. So I have enough for the radish and for the tomato. All right, so I'm gonna start on the radish with the sap green. So I'm just going to make a few thicker lines than maybe what I did for the carrot. And I'm going to make maybe thicker leaves as well. So I'm kind of making like an oval shape with my brush to make the lines or the leaves just a little bit thicker than when I just dabbed it for the carrot. And then I'm gonna use the dark green and just create a few more lines, allow them to bleed into um, the sap green that was first applied, make a couple leaves using the dark green. But for the radish, it's just the sap green and the dark green. There's no um, burnt sienna for the radish. And then last but not least, my favorite, the tomato. Um, so I'm gonna start by applying the burnt umber, which is the dark brown, to the entire stem. All right, so burnt umber to the entire stem, and then I will clean my brush, blot it. And I'm going to apply sap green to all the leaves. It is totally okay if the brown bleeds into the green. That's just gonna create um, kind of a new shade of green. So there's some more um, variation. That's okay, allow it to happen. So sap green to all the leaves. And then to finish it up, I'm gonna use the dark green and I'm just going to apply it to one side of each leaf. It can be the top or the bottom. It doesn't really matter. Um, it can be a mixture of the two. I'm just gonna take my dark green and I'm just gonna run it along one side of each leaf just to create uh, more color, a little more value on these leaves. So the dark green just to one, to one side. Okay, so this is the project. I know it went fast. If you weren't able to keep up with me today, um, you can always rewatch this when it's posted to the Michael Store YouTube channel um, and pauses needed to keep up. I also put written instructions on my website. So um, if written instructions are something that are really helpful for you, you can always download those because when the video is uploaded, I will embed it on my website. Um, mandypeltier.com and you can download the written directions. Um, but I was talking to you about mixing colors inside the brush versus on the palette. I have a class coming up on September 21st. It is available to register for now. And it's these apples. And these apples only use the three primary colors. I promise you, I'm not lying. We will only use um, the cadmium yellow, alizarin crimson, and ultramarine blue to create these. And we will be creating all the colors by layering and by mixing the paint colors in the brush versus on the palette. So if you don't like all the colors we mixed today, come to this class because we'll only be mixing three colors, all right? Um, so I know we're a little bit over, but if any of you, a lot of you are still around, if you would be willing to, if you were able to paint along with me, I'd love to see your work if you just wanna hold it up. And um, let me change my screen to gallery view. Wow, look at these beautiful paintings. Oh, I just love it. If you're on social media, feel free to tag me. I love to see your posts. I comment, I try to comment on every message, every email. Um, Mandy Peltier Artist is my handle, but those are amazing. I'd love to see them more blown up because I'm only seeing these little like thumbnails of them <laughs> uh, through Zoom. So you can email me through my website or you can tag me in social media. I'd love to see these larger. They're just so beautiful. I love it. So um, with that, thank you so much for being here today and sharing this time with me and, and learning from me. It's one of the greatest honors of my life to get to do this and teach you all. So um, thank you so much. I hope I'll see you next week for the blueberries in September for the apples. And then I have a lot more classes that I'm doing drafts for uh, for the, the fall and winter. So um, hope you'll join me again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.